Today on The Topping Show, Starbucks fires a woman for being white and now must pay her millions. Trump promises to purge the deep state. Shyla Jackson attacks the Second Amendment. More businesses flee San Francisco. Stellantis is still debating Tesla chargers. Oracle breaking records for their stock. Kava successfully launches their IPO. Timu wants to challenge Amazon.com. And JP Morgan settles Epstein victims for $270 million. All that and much, much more on The Topping Show. Thank you for taking the time to tune in today. Today's episode of Topic Show is sponsored by Topping Technologies. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added resource and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, see their founder released twice today. Gotta say he's quite handsome and brilliant. He's me, that's the joke. If you're an IT leader or a business owner, you can use a little assistance. You can reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Now, going on to the business part of the podcast, you have Timu wanting to challenge Amazon.com. Timu is a Chinese e-commerce startup. You may have seen them as they seem to have paid for about 50% of all advertisements on social media lately. You cannot escape the virality of all their obnoxious ads, which from a social media perspective is successful because that stupid commercial is stuck in my head and it gets the brain recognition out there. And the whole shtick that I see is they want to make you feel, they literally say they want to treat you like a billionaire, I think, and give you access to the best prices that you know, the, the best prices on the market, no one will touch their prices, as uh, Trump might say. So they show you like the cost for like headphones being like $1.95 for Bluetooth headphones. And they're obviously Apple iPad knockoffs, but it's giving people to this visibility of pricing that no one usually sees. And I've never actually ordered anything from that site, partially because I really don't buy much in general, but It'd be interesting to see what's the delta between that and the authentic product, as well as is it kind of like Wish.com where you order it and it's 99% of the time just total trash. Now, Americans are starting to actually purchase more off of that platform. According to the recent research, recent research they showed that Americans spent 20% more on Timu versus the competitor Sheen, which is another really popular Chinese e-commerce retailer. Now, granted, Timu is still under scrutiny for handling all the personal data, and lawmakers are proposing tighter tariff rules that would obviously hurt its sales. Seeing as how much of an astronomical interconnected the United States and the Chinese economy are, I really don't see the U.S. actually getting serious with much tariffs in, in any in the near future. I think Trump, in terms of my business acumen and studying history and looking at tariffs throughout the years, in my living lifetime, that's the only time I've really seen a, a major impact specifically on a country. And that, even that was specific materials such as steel. And so it'll be interesting to see if lawmakers do anything at all or is just more pontificating so that their district feels good but they don't actually do anything. Which people on the left and the right, politicians tend to do just that, which is basically not much. Now, interestingly enough, Amazon won't include Timu in its price checking algorithm which aims to ensure that Amazon prices stay competitive, which does two things, I think. It kind of signals that Amazon doesn't consider Timu a reputable competitor at the moment, but also wants to ensure that Amazon remains profitable. They've been losing money for decades. They've now become one of the most successful e-commerce, well, not one of, the most successful e-commerce platforms in history. But if it's an apples to oranges comparison, as in the products on Amazon are different than the ones on Timu, they might look the same, but it's different materials, different manufacturers. All of a sudden, Amazon could lose money because obviously the better materials, higher the quality cost. So time shall tell to see when Amazon starts to take them more seriously and treat them as a competitor. Now, other interesting business news, you have Kava successfully launching their IPO. They launched at about $22 per share making the company currently valued at $2.45 billion. Now that's based on the outstanding share count of about 111 million shares. Now they're a very up and coming, I would say, Mediterranean restaurant popping up all over. I may have a little animus because they bought out and killed Texas-based Zoe's Kitchen, which bang for your buck was the best Mediterranean dishes on the planet. It's very, you know, pretty fast way is a great way to get a meal between meetings or doing drop-offs and pounding the pavement as some sales reps might say and it was a great healthy way to get you know meal and then gava bottom and of course 
their salmon kebabs have never been the same, unfortunately. Now, that being said, the 2022 sales were about $564.2 million, which was 12.8% increase compared to the year prior. Now, that being said, they also had a higher loss last year. They lost about $59 million. In 2021, they had a loss of $37.1 million. Granted, now that they have an IPO, you get a huge cash infusion, which will not only it'll have them actually make a profit, but it'll allow them to reinvest in the company. Traditionally, a lot of restaurants especially go IPO so they can get more money for increasing the number of sites, doing some maybe facelifts on the stores, as in changing the furniture and the decor. It'll be interesting to see how they reinvest that capital now that they have a little bit of cash in their pockets, so to say. Now, other interesting businesses, you have Oracle. Their stock is up 50%, and they're breaking personal records left and right. Now, Oracle stock, or rather Oracle, is one of the most largest tech companies on the planet, um, loved by all their customers, not at all cutthroat or um, brutal, not at all shutting off your um, product if you're late by a day to pay them. That's sarcasm. I took a class by Chandler Bing. It was obviously quite successful. Now, this is the best year in Oracle stock since 1999. It's outperforming every large capital tech enterprise stock except for NVIDIA, which actually recently hit a personal record of hitting the trillion dollar valuation on the stock market. Now, their founder, Larry Ellison, has worked to raise Oracle's cloud computing profile after they were left in the dust for many years as, of course, Amazon Web Services with the industry leader, and they gathered the most market share right off the bat. And subsequently, you have Microsoft Azure, as well as you have Google Cloud. Those usually are the top three people talk about. Oracle is increasing, but it'll be interesting to see how long it takes for them to get a, not a reputable market share, but a sig more significant market share. And it's also one of those things where they don't have the best reputation for customer service. So anecdotally, with my technology company, when I'm talking to clients, they never seem like they want to increase their Oracle spend. I'll, I'll just say that much. So time will shall tell to see if they're able to really keep this growth rate up. And their stock is 73% higher over the past 12 months. So another hindsight is 2020, definitely should invest in that. But I digress. Now, other interesting businesses, you have Stellantis. They're debating using Tesla chargers. Now, Stellantis, for those of you who may not know, it is a new name, but the companies that they own and the company itself have been around for a while. Stellantis is the European conglomerate that is a parent company behind the brands and the companies you might know of. You got Everett, Alfa Romeo, you got Chrysler, Cintron, Dodge, DS, Fiat, as well as Jeep, Maserati, Mopar, Opel, Peugeot, Ram, and Vauxhall, and probably one that I can't pronounce in French or something. But, so they own all those brands, and they're still debating, do you use the Tesla chargers, which actually GM and Ford both signed agreements with Tesla the past couple of weeks with an agreement that says those companies are going to utilize Tesla's chargers, which is going to increase Tesla's revenue by a couple billion dollars. Now, the current industry standard is called the Combined Charging System, the CCS1. Acronyms always make it sound smart. And think of it like the HDMI port for your computer or for your TV. Many businesses came together to actually come to a standard, and that's where HDMI came from. But sometimes proprietary is faster, such as the, well, Apple back in the day used to have their Firefox or Firefly or Fire Widget, where they used to call their proprietary thing, which was a lot faster than anyone else. But Apple really doesn't license technology too much. It's part of the reason you buy a $5,000, $10,000 computer from them is because there's a lot of intellectual property in those. Now, when asked for comments, Lanches said, quote, at this time, we continue to evaluate the NACS standard and look forward to discussing more in the future, unquote. Now, this is going to, again, one of the things that Elon was a very prudent businessman. He realized that long term, the biggest bottleneck of EVs is the charging of the damn things. And you need more charging stations. And if you could own those charging stations, another big ad, revenue ad for the company. And if Tesla has the best technology for charging the cars the fastest and most reliably, that's yet another reason to use their standard. So given that you have two of the largest automotive companies already having agreements with Tesla to do that, there's probably a big advantage. You also have economies of scale, depending on what the cost of it is to actually make the widget adapter to put into the car for the actual plug to go in. You might get to the point where if everyone is using the same little adapter that you plug into it, the cost per unit might be prohibitive. It might be so low, it would be hard to say no. There's a lot of upside to it, so time shall tell, but 
if I were a gambling man, I'd probably venture on the side of they probably will go with the Tesla. Now, going on to the culture part of the podcast, you have Starbucks firing a woman for being white, and she just won $25.6 million, which is quite a good chunk of change, although after taxes, it's about $3.95. Sarcasm. No, a little bit. I mean, they, they, they take over half, but still. Now, in this particular instance, you had a Starbucks manager called Shannon Phillips, and she was a manager over in Philadelphia, and there was an issue with the Starbucks store in which they refused to let two African-American men use the restroom, and it went on social media. They, of course, they decried the R word, racism, and they called the police. They got kicked out. It was a big PR nightmare for Starbucks, and I think the important thing to note in this instance, they were not customers, which in terms of a society breakdown, I don't care what your race is. If you're using someone's facilities for free, you're kind of a piece of shit. I, I'm trying to think of a polite way of saying it. You're a grifter, a leech, a, uh, what's another fancy word for saying you're just, you're just feeding off society. Now, back in the day, everyone, used to have a kind of a certain standard of cultural understanding and obsessed it, upset, uh, acceptance. And even to this, even maybe it's just that my parents are better than everyone else's perhaps, but in some ways for sure. But it's one of those things where it's culturally understood. And my dad always taught me, if you go into a gas station or a Starbucks, and let's say you're, you just need to use the restroom. It is common courtesy because you are utilizing their facilities. They are incurring a cost for you using that. The common courtesy says you purchase a product from their store. It doesn't matter um, necessarily the, qu- the price of that item. It's a gesture of goodwill that you are thanking them for allowing, the, to, allowing them to, for you to use their facility. And even in my case, if I have to use the restroom and I want to use a nicer restroom where the odds of me getting stabbed are considerably lower and I might go to a Starbucks, I at least buy a bottled water, as uh, some might say, or uh, one of those little, okay, we call it carbonated um, seltzer drinks. And those are, you know, I mean, that might be one or two dollars. And to me, that's the price of using their restroom. And it's just a common courtesy thing because, again, they are incurring a cost and you are using something that you're not privileged to. They are a private business made to make a profit and provide their customers an exceptional experience. So it was a huge PR nightmare. And is one of those issues where she received $25 million in punitive damages as well as $600,000 in com- compensatory damages. Now, she had overlooked that location as well as 100 other locations, and she was fired in 2019. So this lawsuit took about five years, so I can't imagine the stress of having to go through that long and having to deal with that many lawyers. After the lawyer's fees, that's, that's, that's another big fee. You got the government and the lawyer's fees. That's a... Uh, how much of that money is she really going to get? Now, another thing is she's been at Starbucks for 13 years. And during this ordeal, she noted that after the two African Americans were arrested at Starbucks, they ordered that she put the white sales manager at that store on administrative leave. And he'd been at the company for 15 years. Now, the discrepancy of how this becomes anti-white racism or just racism against white people, whatever vernacular you choose, is that Starbucks did not order her to implement similar disciplinary action towards the African-American employees at that store. So they did not get any disciplinary action. And even more insult to injury, the two African-American men who were at the store refused to buy anything and used the bathroom Starbucks acquiesced and just bent the knee and they said, okay, we're going to give you an undisclosed lump sum of money. So I can't, probably more than six figures if I would guess, or maybe millions, who knows. And they also get free college education, which is a great deal on their part for not paying to use the bathroom. So if anything, they should be, it's astronomical. I know many people I know are still paying their college debt. They could have just used the bathroom without asking or not buying anything. And in terms of cultural significance, it's one of those sad things where if you trust someone and you hire an employee or hire a contractor, 
you should be confident not only in their abilities to do the job, but also handle, handle situations under pressure. And in this case, the company completely ignored the confidence that they instilled on their employees when they hired them and left them out to dry. They didn't trust their employees. That, and if I were an employee at Starbucks, I, they clearly don't have your back, as some might say. They, jo they chose two strangers over people who have been working at the company for over a decade. And it is just astonishing how little confidence businesses have because they're so scared of the mob coming after them. They're so scared of social media of being canceled, some might say, that they would believe strangers over someone they've been working with over a decade, which is just a huge, fascinating, and disappointing, pivotal moment where culturally, you, you know, wind back the clock 10, 15 years ago, you hear stories where the businesses would stick to their guns. They would believe their employees because the employees with their family, they've been working together for 10 plus years. Of course they believe them, but not so much in this case. Now, other interesting culture news, you have Cinemark leaving San Francisco. Now, Cinemark being one of the most successful movie theater companies in the United States, headquartered in Plano, Texas, and they had one of their Cinemark locations, and when they were talking to reporters, they said, quote, Cinemark can confirm that it decided to permanently close the Century San Francisco Center 9 and XT Theater shortly before the conclusion of its lease following a comprehensive review of local business conditions, unquote. Which is the nicest, most politically way of saying your city sucks. Because crime is rampant and taxation is even worse. And culturally, it continues to just fall down the cesspool of being one of the worst cities in the United States. It used to be, again, wind back the clock, one of the one big, it was a cultural, some would say it was a cultural significance. They had a lot of technology, a lot of businesses were there. The weather's always perfect, I know. But it's gotten to the point where there's so much rampant lawlessness and drug use, it's it's becoming unlivable and unprofitable for all these businesses that, again, you can't bleed money, uh, you can't bleed money being a term for it, lose money forever. You have to make a profit and you have to keep things safe for your employees as well as your customers. The most, ex the most important thing in a brick and mortar retail experience is the customer experience. That's all you hear about when it comes to advertising and sales. When everything around retail, it's all about the end user, the customer experience, not just to get them in that door, but once they get them in that door, how do you blow, knock their sock, socks off so they're inspired to go there again as we live in a more and more e-commerce society where people are just staying inside more and more. So I'm not too surprised that they're leaving. Now. Other interesting culture news, which drives right into this, you have one of the largest malls in San Francisco leaving as well. And guess what? They actually had a little bit more temerity, a little bit more guts there. They said specifically why they're leaving. Now, the Westfield Company, they're going to stop their mall mortgage payments at the San Francisco location and giving it back to the lender. Now, they specifically blame crime for the falling sales and the Nordstrom closer. Nordstrom being one of the best, most premier clothing, I was going to say convenience store. It's a convenient place to buy clothing. It's probably a, it's a higher end clothing store, great customer experience. And unfortunately they had to leave San Francisco a few months ago because again, crime is through the roof and they're not doing anything to stop it. Now Westfield, they noted that the firm is going to default on their $558 million loan, handing it back to the lender, which also means they're giving up any equity they might have had in that. You saw this, this might sound familiar, like deja vu. It is. The Hilton Hotel in San Francisco did the same thing with the holding company that was working in that location because they're losing so much money and they know no one's going to buy it. So the mall is going to stay in effect open for now, but malls are a fascinating thing where this is just going to tumble worse and worse and worse. It's not going to get better anytime soon. Malls are perhaps the most prime example of the domino or the ripple effect. If you look at why malls succeed traditionally they would actually get sponsorships by think about it the good old classics jc penny you got sears you got nordstrom you have a anchor store now an anchor store sounds exactly what it would like like it sounds they would tell the development company hey we will be your largest tenant we will be the anchor the big thing that brings people there once they get there then you get that is a good advertising thing you go to all the smaller stores like remember back in the day it used to be spencer's hot topic forever 23 or 21 aero pastel all that kind of stuff and they say, hey, you got a lot of these other stores coming. You should come along as well. 
So you get a nice good domino effect where all of them are coming because those logos are there. Customers like those logos, they like their brands, they're gonna go there. Now you're having the inverse these days where more and more and more of these stores are leaving, they're becoming ghost towns. And the compelling thing for a user or a end user or the customer is you get lots of options. You have many stores in a small compact area. And they're just leaving more and more and more. Some might think this phenomenon is isolated to San Francisco, but they might think it's actually not just isolated. They might think it's all over the U.S. Contrary to that, Westfield actually has some data on, no, 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 it is San Francisco that's this bad. Now, Westfield is a holding company where they actually manage hotels across the United States. And they noted that specifically, the San Francisco's op occupancy level had dropped to 55%. Almost half the stores are gone. That's white space. That's empty, ugly looking areas for consumers to see a part of a mall, those little, all those little stores to see emptiness. Not only has that's got to have a mental effect and aesthetic effect is not good for the mall. It just looks bad. And of course, fiscally it's bad as well because there's less companies paying the holding company because of course they make money by renting out spaces and yada, yada, yada. Now, when Westfield talked about their national average for their occupancy rates, those are currently at about 93%. So again, malls aren't dead. It just depends on location. But in San Francisco, occupancy is at 55%. Nationwide, 93%. That's a huge delta. That's again, I'm not no math. I'm not a mathematician, but let's just say it's about half, or it's twice as worse as the rest of the United States. Now, culturally speaking, will they turn this around? How do they? No, they're leaning right into this. I'm talking about the people who are voting, people who are in San Francisco. There are drugs, there are so many drugs rampant in the street, you have to avoid the needles. It's the city where they actually had to make an app called the Poop App, where there are so many, there are so many people defecating in the city, they invented an app that showed you all the areas so you could try to avoid it. That's how, far the culture has crumbled in that city and all these businesses are leaving in droves because again even whole, i believe whole foods they had they filed 500 and about 83 police reports in about 13 months there's that much crime and all their carts are stolen as well and again they left the city the most pro progressive or liberal company whole foods left San Francisco, the pinnacle of that ideology, that political sphere. Will they change their mind? Will they do anything to fix it? Time shall tell, but that culture needs an overhauling like no tomorrow, because again, it's not safe for the people to live there. There's a lot of people who are getting hurt and there's a lot of negative ripple effects of people. Being, it's not a great situation, but they are choosing it. So time shall tell to see if they make a more prudent decision. Now, going on to the politics part of the podcast, you have Sheila Jackson attacking the Second Amendment and, of course, looking woefully ignorant, which is entertaining, but also disappointing in terms of politicians and our rights. Now, she's a politician and a lawyer, so the worst of both worlds, some might say. The, it's one of those things. And she's currently serving the U.S. House of Representatives, representing the 18th District of Houston, Texas, which she is the antithesis of a Texan, if you ask me. Now, she recently was giving a little pitch on why we should ban certain things. Now, this current pitch, and again, she's on the House floor, this is the phenomenon dealing with the SIG arm brace or the AR-15 pistol brace. Now, not to brag about the financing behind this, this podcast, but we have upgraded to cardstock level graphics. Now, here's a fun game. Can you tell the difference between these two things? Yeah, not many can. They're mechanically exactly the same, basically. Now, the one on top is the arm brace. You see, there's a little bit of Velcro there. The purpose was actually invented by a disabled veteran who wanted to have the privilege of shooting an AR-15 safely. So that would allow you to stick your arm through the stock, or arm brace, and you strap it around to stabilize. It was called a stabilizing brace. At the time, the ATF approved the item for sale so millions, literally about estimates between 10 and 40 million Americans purchased that. Now, the question comes into the fact that what is a short barrel rifle? Short barrel rifles are regulated thanks to the National Firearms Act of 1934, and you have to pay $200 tax stamp and extra paperwork, extra background checks. 
Not illegal, just takes extra paperwork, and most states allow it. However, you could just buy that instead of registering it as a short barrel rifle and buying the one on bottom, which the one on bottom is a tra traditional rifle stock. So the government decided we need to get rid of these pieces of rubberized plastic because they're a threat. So they banned them a couple of weeks ago. Now, if you have one in possession, depending on how you interpret the law, you will be subject to a $250,000 fine and 10 years in prison for a piece of plastic. That does not mechanically change the rifle in any way. And again, millions of people purchase it legally, but the ATF, even though they're not allowed to make laws, they reinterpret laws all the time, which makes firearms owner, they have to stay on top of the law because again, they were made felons overnight if they kept those products. So what does she have to say about this? She, is she an enlightened individual with lots, did, did she do a lot of research into this? No, but it's entertaining. Who would even think that you could tamper with the second amendment? It's in the bill of rights. Oh. Oh, 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 wait, I actually agree. Let's, let's stop this right now. She actually sounds smart. No, she's, no, no. I, I. But we do believe that when you have this weapon being created to be the kind of dangerous, lethal weapon to kill, Americans will stand up and say, it's not about the Second Amendment. It it's funny she's never this passionate when it comes to things like fentanyl overdoses that are killing millions of Americans every year, and that's not protected under the Second Amendment, or any of the amendments, actually. And again, they're talking about transfer, transforming this rifle into a killing machine. It's not changing the mechanics of it. It's still a semi-automatic rifle. All you're doing is putting this stabilizing brace on it. And actually, it's more inaccurate to use it as a brace. So let's, let's keep going. It's, I know it's painful, but still. It's about saving lives. Eight children a day die from gun violence. Not true. In addition... 40,000 Americans. That number includes people that are like 17 and 18, which again is tragic, but they're manipulating the stats to look good in their favor. Die from gun violence throughout. Also, all those are taking place mostly in the inner cities, and yet no one wants to actually enforce the laws or actually go after the perpetrators in those cities. Out the year. We love and respect and admire our veterans. Really? You do? But this, the stabilizing brace was invented for a service disabled veteran, if you respect veterans, surely you wouldn't go against them and try to take that away from them. She but would. at the same time, oh, we a mentor of mine used to tell me, anything before the butt is bullshit. I respect this, like when someone foolishly says, I respect the Second Amendment, or the First Amendment, but you shouldn't be able to write a book. Yeah, everything after the butt is bullshit. Respect our first responders to say, that we don't need automatic weapons in the hands of civilians. She is as wise as she is beautiful. I'm saving you by not showing you how she looks like. And I don't want your eyes to fall out or burn out like the end of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Or is it the Temple of Doom? The good ones. Ones I made years ago. No. Automatic weapons. Again, a nomenclature. They is designed, just like assault rifles, to sound scary. Full automatic weapons are prohibitively expensive. They had to be, because the law is currently written, they had to be manufactured as well as registered with the United States ATF U.S. Treasury before 1986. So that limits the supply to very, very little. So an AR-15 at the store, semi-automatic, is going to cost you about $1,000. A transferable AR-15 machine gun is legal in, about, in more than half the states. But because of that law it had to be made and registered before 1986, that means that same gun, full auto, is going to be about $30,000 plus. Automatic weapons are basically unicorns. You, most people will never have the privilege of owning them because of the supply and demand. They're so expensive. All the rifles we're talking about right here, they're just scary black looking AR-15s. So mechanically, the same thing we've had for over 100 years, semi-automatic technology. There's no hunting purpose. Another, I, it, it's hard to not stop this every two seconds when she makes so many lies and is so woefully ignorant. Hunting has nothing to do with the Second Amendment. Again, I'm, 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 maybe, I'm maybe assuming too much to think politicians actually read the Bill of Rights or read the Federalist Papers or read anything by the Founding Fathers or have the ability to read it all. Left, right, is even people, um, of course, every side of, the uh, side of the political aisle 
There's some subjects that are so woefully ignorant, it's astonishingly disappointing. There's no purpose. You can buy the brakes without a background check. It's a stock. So, again, fancy graphics today. She's saying you can buy the brace. Yes, you can. Prior to the law, you can buy that for, I don't know, 60, 100 bucks. It's a piece of plastic. If you want it, you could 3D print them. You don't need a background check for a stock on a rifle. That's like saying you need a background check to buy... I can't, actually, I can't think of a metaphor ridiculous enough to actually correlate to this example she's giving. Well, maybe I shall try. That's like saying... You, you, you can buy ink for a pen without a background check, and then you can write things. Well, yeah, we have the First Amendment. Ridiculous? Yes, but I, I probably, it, I'm sorry, it does get worse. But when it becomes a dangerous weapon, when that brace changes the gun's legal status and makes it, in essence, the same... She's pretending to read the poster board she brought, which... I do appreciate when politicians bring poster boards because it makes it moderately entertaining. And again, this is the first time probably everyone, anyone's watched C-SPAN in a decade. So in terms of marketing, you do want visuals, which is why I printed that today. And we will get to the point where we have the live things that pop up on the screen and show video in real time. I'd censor this one just to save your eyes. But it's one of those things where if you take the time to like, subscribe, and comment, it always helps the channel outgrow and develop. And again, the more the channel grows, the more I'll be able to increase the investment in terms of those materials and the quality of the work. So greatly appreciate you taking time to like, subscribe, share, comment, etc. That caused a mass shooting at a Boulder, Colorado supermarket. The stabilizing brace made and a shorter barrel made a pistol under federal gun regulations. Saving lives is why I'm standing here on the floor. But a brace can be bought without a background check. Might I say that there are veterans in the ATF. This... That's disgusting. There are veterans in the ATF? People who fought and served for their country to preserve our amendments. And they work in the ATF, which their job is to restrict your freedoms. I would be interested to see the percentage of veterans who actually work in the ATF. There probably are some provision specifically is to deal with when you make it a lethal weapon to be used like an assault weapon to kill people that's what the atf is against eight children dying every day and forty thousand americans manipulated result because they again change the parameters so that it sounds as worse as possible but again emotion over intelligence or actual facts is usually what politicians do and unfortunately it's exceedingly effective Americans dying throughout the year through gun violence, not your Second Amendment. And let me let you hear from the person who actually designed it. It was the creator of the SB Tactical Stabilizing Brace who acknowledged in a 2017 interview with the editor of the Firearm Blog that many who brought the braces did so to avoid the National Firearms Registration. They were going to do bad. Oh, wait, let's get better. Bad. Not those good veterans. This is not an injury to our veterans. It is saving lives. It will not save. Who would stand up here against a veteran? The Nobody. Emotional rhetoric. Not intelligence, just emotion. Emotion. Again, I hope more and more Americans wake up and actually do their own research or listen to shows like this, which educate you as well. But, yeah, this, this law, again, it's not going to change. It will not save a single life. And it's all emotional rhetoric. It's not intelligence at all. And again, it's a piece of plastic. It's literally a pistol, a stabilizing brace. And again, at the stroke of a pen, or I guess these days they probably just t digitally updated their archive or their laws. Now there's between 10 and 40 million felons in the United States who, again, if they're caught, they're going to lose the right to vote. They will never be able to vote again. Let's pay a $250,000 fine and 10 years in pr federal prison for having that little piece of plastic and not registering it with the government. That should scare the living hell out of every American. And I know lawsuits are already being filed. People are challenging the law and doing it the right way, which is through the legal process. But there are still people... There is a, well, I have a whole, I'll have a whole article on Monday, or rather, 
what day is it? Next episode, we'll go and do it. But it's one of those things where it is a great way to punish your political enemies because on average, I would guess more people are buying these or more on the right side of the political aisle on average. And all of a sudden, they can't vote. Now, you might think she's done talking because she said a lot of nonsense. But no, it gets minor, more disappointingly entertaining. I mean, she is, um, again, she is wrong in every conceivable way. Let's go to the next part of the video. AR-15 in my hand, I wish I had it. It is as heavy as 10 boxes that you might be moving. How dumb can you possibly be? She's saying an AR-15 weighs as much as 10 boxes. The AR-15, from its inception, was one of the lightest rifles ever made. It was, at the time, revolutionary, engineered by the Armor Light Company, ironically in California, an aerospace company. And it was, at the time, bleeding edge of technology, using, utilizing a lot of aluminum. It is one of the lightest rifles you can possibly purchase. And again, which is why it's a great home defense rifle, or arms, whatever term you like to use, because again, it's very light, the recoil is very little, but she gets, she's even more wrong than she already is. It, I'll continue. Uh, and the bullet that is utilized, a 50 caliber, these kinds of bullets uh, need to be licensed and do not need... She says the AR-15 shoots a 50 caliber bullet. I got props for this. So again, this is a politician who's clearly as intelligent as a pet rock. No, I'm sorry. That's an insult to my pet rock. I love my Rocky. He's always a good listener. He never, always stays in place when you tell him to sit. But this person is saying that an AR-15 uses the 50 caliber round. Here's a 50 caliber round, which now that I think about it, I should have bought as a tax deduction for the show. But a friend let me use the prop. So that's the standard 50 caliber round that she says it is an AR-15. No. This is what an AR-15 shoots. Notice, uh, that's a little different here. Yeah. Astronomical difference. Astronomical. Although at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what size they are. Because that's your right. And some might say there's one or two AR-15 Beowulf 50 cals out there. They were a niche product. They were a cool product at the time. But no, they're trying to use more emotional rhetoric to confuse, obfuscate the truth, and just bully you and emotionally blackmail you into voting for them. And the only thing that is more concerning is if she is fully aware of all this and still doing it. Which I'm sure there's some politicians that are doing that just to push their agenda. Which I find completely disgusting. Now, going on to other political news, you have Trump, presidential nominee. He is promising to purge the deep state. Kind of like purging or uh, draining the swamp, which he attempted to do round one. And although this came out a couple weeks ago, it is going viral now. So let's go ahead and play a little bit of his speech. Here's my plan to dismantle the deep state and reclaim our democracy from Washington corruption once and for all, and corruption it is. First, I will immediately reissue my 2020 executive order restoring the president's authority to remove rogue bureaucrats, and I will wield that power very aggressively. Second, we will clean out all of the corrupt actors in our national security and intelligence apparatus. That'd be nice. Because they're there. Now, to give you some quantifiable data points of example, real world examples in which there are people who have specifically broken orders, broken the law, and yet still completely hide from any responsibility and acquiesce from any, pretty much anything, to, anything of doing the right thing. You have Representative Jim, uh, Jim Jeffries, where you had, when, during his presidency, Trump ordered the troops to leave Syria. He, he was curious of why the hell we're even there. There's not a war. We haven't declared anything. Let's get him out. So he gave an order as the president. Now, he was told, and the United States public were told, yep, we got the troops out. They're coming home. However, under oath, then Jim Jeffries admitted, oh yeah, they lied. Quote, 
we were always playing shell games to make it not clear to our leadership how many troops we had out there, unquote. He later admitted that the total number of troops was, quote, a lot more, unquote, than the several hundred Trump wanted. Was Jim Jeffries disciplined in any way? Of course not. He's a government bureaucrat. He's set for life. Not elected, but appointed and basically unprecedented job security. Think of the United States Postal Service as perhaps the most day-to-day -day interaction people can relate to in terms of having a job you can't possibly get fired from. But I continue. And there are plenty of them. The departments and agencies that have been weaponized will be completely overhauled so that faceless bureaucrats will never again be able to target and persecute conservatives. Which happened multiple times as far back as when President Obama was in office. You had all the nonprofits and all the IRS targeted them. It was over. They targeted only one affiliated political group that was on the left. Every other one, other one of them was on the right. Not a coincidence. Christians or the left's political enemies, which they're doing now at a level that nobody can believe. Also, when it comes to the missing documents, or not, not the missing documents, rather the having inappropriate documents or documents not being stored properly, Remember, Mike Pence was not charged. Hillary Clinton was not charged. She actually destroyed cell phones with hammers and used a bleach bit, a software to completely wipe her server, an on-prem server with all of her emails. She was not prosecuted. And, oh yeah, Biden was not prosecuted and he had the classified documents with his old Corvette. Which was cool. is a cool Corvette, I'll give him that much, but they all did that. And this probably also goes to say something about how we have too many classified documents just everywhere. But those three were not prosecuted, but Trump is. The, the government is fervently going after him specifically. Even possible. Third, we will totally reform FISA courts, which are so corrupt that the judges seemingly do not care when they are lied to in warrant applications. So many judges. Now, the FISA court was actually set up as a mechanism to try ironically, to protect the U.S. citizens' security and their privacy. It's rudimentary speaking, it's how government agencies ask, hey, we need to do surveillance on Bobby down the street. And the courts will say, hey, this is yes or no constitutional, yeah, you can't. They said no like three times maybe. It's basically just a green light, yeah, you do whatever you want. That's the big controversy around that court stems from that overwhelming number of the times they say yes. Judges have seen so many applications that they know were wrong, or at least they must have known. They do nothing about it. They're lied to. Fourth, to expose the hoaxes and abuses of power that have been tearing our country apart, we will establish a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to declassify and publish all documents on deep state spying, censorship, and corruption. And there are plenty of them. That'd be a huge achievement. But again, JFK tried to do a lot of this and it didn't end well for him. Fifth, we will launch a major crackdown on government leakers who collude with the fake news to deliberately weave false narratives and to... It is also interesting that Trump's tax releases were inappropriately leaked and no one faced any prosecution. It is an illegal act as personal sensitive data, but it got leaked. Also, remember the Supreme Court of the United States where they're debating if Roe versus Wade was constitutional or if they would overturn it and give the power of that issue of abortion to the states individually, that leak was, that decision was pre-leaked. The, the data was out there about how they're gonna vote before they actually released it to the public, which again, ironically kind of solidified their votes because if they changed their votes, it would have shown that they would cave to the mob, which would not be a good thing for the United States. And yet, it almost like they didn't even investigate who leaked that memo or who leaked that document. They just happened to never look into it, basically. Subvert our government and our democracy. When possible, we will press criminal charges. Sixth, we will make every inspector general's office independent and physically separated from the departments they oversee so they do not become the protectors of the deep state. Seventh, I will ask Congress to establish an independent auditing system to continually monitor our intelligence agencies to ensure they are not spying on our citizens or 
running disinformation campaigns against the American people, or that they are not spying on someone's campaign like they spied on my campaign. No one was prosecuted or held responsible for that in any way, by the way. Eighth, we will continue the effort launched by the Trump administration to move parts of the sprawling federal bureaucracy to new locations outside the Washington Swamp. Just as I moved the Bureau of Land Management to Colorado, as many as 100,000 government positions could be moved out, and I mean immediately, of Washington to places filled with patriots who love America, and they really do love America. Not a bad idea to actually boost local economies to those small towns as well and get people who don't want to live in D.C. Because if you want to live in D.C., let's face it, you're going to be politically pushed one way. Ninth, I will work to ban federal bureaucrats from taking jobs at the companies they deal with and that they regulate. So they deal with these companies and they regulate these companies and then they want to take jobs from these companies. doesn't work that way. Such a public display cannot go on and it's taking place all the time like with big pharma finally i will push you can't help but notice the fda the federal department the federal drug administration you see a lot of people going back and forth between the big pharma companies and that comp and that government entity coincidentally i'm sure it's a constitutional amendment to impose term limits on members of congress this is how i will shatter the deep state and restore government that is controlled by the people and for the people. Thank you very much. So that last part is huge. Again, most politicians never even touch the idea of term limits because most of them are self-serving, selfish bastards. Pardon the French. But he actually, had, if he can get term limits, that would be unprecedented. The only time I've heard of any politician even whisper the idea, I believe about well, maybe six months ago, Ted Cruz and one of his colleagues put together a proposal but even that wouldn't go into effect. Wouldn't that go into a effect for I believe like eight years, at quite some time. So they all would ha have a lot of run rate. But to actually limit some of those powers, so you have someone who hasn't been, who's not in politics for fifty to sixty years. In terms of a political chess move and a, more, a board, a uh, move on the political chessboard, Trump I think made a pretty good one. I know there's a lot of independent voters and a lot of people in the middle who are quite frankly disgusted and annoyed with people who just have a career, being a career politician, and real, also people in government who just face no consequences. So in terms of increasing his voter base, this is a good way to do it, in my opinion. Because again, ever since I was in high school, everyone's talked about term limits and getting rid of people who are just lifelong government employees with no actual accountability or performance needed. If someone, if someone could actually execute on those ideals and really do it, that would be unprecedented. So, brilliant political chess move. He'll probably get a couple more votes after this and granted he's still being prosecuted with all the indictments. So, I think it's still an uphill battle, but time shall tell. It seems to be that he is making the right moves. Now, going on to the business blunder of the day, you have J.P. Morgan Chase paying $290 million to the Epstein victims. Epstein victims being Jeffrey Epstein. Now, this is from a class action lawsuit brought by the victims of Epstein. Epstein was a J.P. Morgan client from 1998 to 2013. And he was kept even after being arrested in 2006 on prostitute-related charges and incidents with children. I'm trying to think of... How to not get this video blacklisted on YouTube. Pretty much the most heinous, disgusting act anyone could commit in society. He did, and he actually profited off of that and facilitated that service for the most morally vacuous people on the planet. And the J.B. Morgan said, yeah, you're our kind of customer. We're going to keep you. Ironically, or hilariously, or just really weirdly, you had Kanye West recently have a huge mental breakdown and say some disgusting anti-Semitic things. And the rumor is he had about a billion dollars in assets at Chase and they kicked Kanye West out. So you can perform the most deprived acts of humanity on children and be a customer of JP Morgan Chase. But 
if you're Kanye West, they kick you out for saying things, which should say something about the priorities of society as well as the banking industry or that bank specifically. Perhaps this belongs in the culture section as well. But interestingly enough, you have coming out a couple of days ago, this is the one of the largest claims in the U.S. bank and it is about potentially 100 victims. And it was led by a former ballet dancer known as Jan, Jane Doe, who said that Epstein abused them um, when they were young girls and teens. Again, the most morally vacuous person on the planet was Jeffrey Epstein, I believe. Or perhaps the people funding him and facilitating how he magically made was wealthy overnight, apparently. Now, Rutgers, the article that I referenced in here, they claim that Epstein killed himself at age 66 in Manhattan jail cell in August 2019, which is the biggest lie in history, perhaps. Keep in mind, this jail cell, you had two cameras that magically broke down for reasons. The security guards weren't there at the time because for reasons. By the way, the security guards, they had no penalties for that as well. They basically got a plea and, again, at completely abdicated all responsibility for reasons. And he also was allowed to keep shoelaces and I believe even a belt, even though he apparently tried to commit suicide weeks before. Spoiler alert, they don't allow you to keep those things in prison. And of course, when the doctors look at him, you had a doctor come out and go, yeah, he was, he was strangled to death. So the biggest lie in modern history is probably people saying he killed himself. Yeah, he didn't. And people think this is a huge business blunder, perhaps more of a moral blunder, but so JP Morgan has to pay this $200 million, $290 million fine, which sounds like a lot of money. Relatively speaking, it is. It's more than most people have seen in a lifetime. But keep in mind, in terms of the total assets that JP Morgan has, they have $3.66 trillion. Not billion, trillion dollars in assets. And they recently just bought out First Republic Bank, one of the largest banks as well, them being over on the West Coast, JP Morgan being headquartered in New York City or somewhere in New York. But to hire a client like Epstein and have him as a client at your bank and continue to do business with him even after, this is astonishing, publicly he was charged with files um, for to the child abuse and they let him out of prison on, I don't know if his good behavior, it was just a, an ankle bracelet tracker, but he got out and they still did business with him after he was convicted. That's gotta be the moral, that's gotta be the moral blunder, the more the most morally vacuous thing I've heard in, in business for quite some time. And it goes without saying, that is the business blunder of the day. Thank you everyone again for taking the time to tune in today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. It really helps the channel grow and develop. I've noticed that every time there's more and more comments, there's a lot more views, I greatly appreciate it. Also, don't forget to tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, heck, tell your enemies, tell anyone and everyone to stay safe, fight the good fight.